moderator, our distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, our friends and, and our enemies. It's like Imam Talib uh, Abdul Rashid said from MIB. When it comes, for instance, to the Wajdeen community, they don't want to acknowledge that there's any other history towards Islam in this country. The, when we start talking about foundational, uh, foundation setting uh, or pioneers, they make the history to be narrowed down only to the nation. So that is the qualm or that is the beef that some of the elders have that, that it's true they didn't come into the nation. We have an example in the 1930s where uh, Haj Wali Akram, he left the Ahmadiyya movement and came directly into uh, uh, Sunni uh, Islam. You understand what I'm saying? He didn't come by means of the nation and he was actually contemporary of Elijah Muhammad. And he was actually a diplomatic status, you know, uh, uh, globally, you know, a, as far as being a Muslim leader. And there was a time actually people where there was a dialogue on national leadership in this country. And there were people that were being looked at as being national leaders. And there was a time when the African American community had much more weight in decision making and the direction that the Muslim community was going to go in than they do today. Right. Uh, and in the past, the whole concept of immigrant leadership was very minimal. But part of what happens with the discussion on the nation is that there are historical the historical beef. There's qualms that people have for certain because of certain things, and you know, like Imam Talib Abdul Rashid has said also, you know that uh, part of the Orientalist way of dealing with the history of Islam in this country is that it's not accurate. You know, there's a certain narrative that comes out of the university system with regard to the history of Islam, and there's a certain narrative which is actually also dominant within the general community that is not holistic. You know, and you have community historians. Uh, or I would like to call them griots or whatever, like people like Akil Fahad, who was used to be much more active online, you know, that will bring other elements, you know what I'm saying, of the history of Islam uh, in this country that is not only uh, a history which is only rooted with the nation, you know what I'm saying? Um, and there, there's other examples, other uh, historical uh, foundation points to the, to the way that Islam spread here. Not to mention the fact that at the end of the day, uh, the reality is that the history of Islam in the Americas has everything to do with going back to West Africa. And many of, and, and this is some work that I've been doing, uh, uh, bringing together scholarship on this issue for some time period and, and thinking, and it goes into inform why I believe that Malcolm was a reviver of the deen. But the reality of the situation is that when you look at uh, the history of Islam in the Americas, in the Americas, I'm talking about all of the Americas, not just North America. When you look at the history of Islam, there's no doubt that with the collapse of Al-Andalus and the collapse of, of West Africa and what took place in transatlantic slavery, which Muslims and non-Muslims participated in, you understand what I'm saying? That the, it, it shows that there's continuity you know, uh, of the, 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 there's a continual lineage of Muslims from, from, from West Africa in, in large numbers having been in the Americas and it shaped the culture. It shaped the culture of the Americas. So there was a certain consciousness in practice and habit in value and ethic in belief at some points and not totally because it, it was made unclear. It was wiped out. It was weakened by code of law, by force, by violence, by a number of different, by circumstances, by conditions. But we have enough documentation to know that the history of Islam in the Americas goes back to centers of Islamic learning. So, as a matter of fact, there's many precedents to show that there was a, a, a percentage that was not small of Muslim scholars that were in the Americas, that were in the Americas and had, had impact on the culture. You know what I'm saying? And there were alliances that were made. Well, I, I, earlier I talked about the alliance that the Prophet ﷺ made with the people of the book, but there was an alliance also that was made later on uh, in history closer to our time between Muslims and non-Muslims. Where do you think the Maroon societies came from? Where do you think a lot of the uprisings came from with the Africans and, and, the, and those who were uh, the indigenous of these lands, right? Uh, 
where do you think that came from? The alliances that came from. You know, there's the Bundu example in West Africa that were what was an example of Muslims living with non-Muslims that was alongside of what some scholars call the jihad states, whether it was Omar Tal or whether it was uh, uh, Sheikh Uthman then followed you or others. There were examples that people were trying to figure out what to do because of the systematic cultural clashes, systematic changes in cultural clashes that were taking place that were causing uh, injustices to arise, that were causing Muslims to be enslaved, that were causing the, the death of, of non-Muslims. You understand what I'm saying? There were, there were a lot of transformations that took place with the collapse of Al-Andalus that Noam Chomsky calls it the beginning of the New World Order. You, you understand what I'm saying? Uh, and, and so there's things that we have to understand that have taken place in the last 500 years and have only been made more, more clear with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. But there's things that took place when the Ottoman Empire was a dominant force in the world that created certain conditions which led up to what we see today. And if we're not good students of history, we won't understand that. So there's historical realities that have to be understood, and there's a politics that we have to understand of how to engage and how to practice. And there's a certain scholarship that we have to have and intelligence that we have to have when we engage people. You know, if Muslims, if some people don't feel comfortable, then they should, they, 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 they don't feel comfortable, but they can't dictate where leadership is pointing the community to grow. Some people, their orientation, is predicated on on hate. Their, predic their orientation is predicated on hate, whether Muslim or non-Muslim. That's the orientation that they have. It's not on justice. It's not on equity. It's not on the pursuit of truth. It's not on the pursuit of the common good. It's not understanding the current conditions and necessity, the way harm and benefit for the well-being of society. No, and they don't operate out of those principles. You understand what I'm saying? And that's not to say that they're not well intended. It's not to judge intention. The intention is with Allah. But it's to uh, look at certain orientations and ideas and practices. And we have to ask whether it is to our benefit or not. And history has, uh, you know, a, a, a whole uh, list, a whole classification, categorization, you know, set of experiences of where we have done well, where we have failed where uh, it was okay, could have been done better and so on and so forth. And so there's a lot of things that we have engaged in in dealing with different groups that have existed in specific in the black community. My personal position, and I believe that it aligns with where it moves to, is that we have to stop collapsing uh, the black community, you know what I'm saying, in the name of what is going on overseas and so on and so forth. That's going to take a bold position from the Muslims in this country because it's going to require solid scholarship. It's going to require experience and not just book knowledge. It's going to require solid scholarship. And there is a tendency of thought that has emerged with people like Dr. Tahar Wyatt, with people like Munir, with people uh, like Shadid Muhammad and others within the Salafi Dawah that has decided that it's not going to take that type of approach against the Muslim community in that way. You understand what I'm saying? That was being taken before. And that's my, that was my, a few years back. And, and I still, I have a lot of love for the brother and a lot of respect for the brother. Uh, and I pulled away from being in that engagement because I have respect and love for the brother, which is Imam uh, Amin Muhammad from AC. I don't agree with some of his positions that he takes. You understand what I'm saying? I understand what he's trying to do. But this is one of the things that I was saying that like now, while there's a certain tendency in the Muslim community trying to establish the idea of a traditional orientation within the black community, one of the things that I had mentioned indirectly many times. So in order to do that, are we going to collapse? Are we going to attempt to collapse the Salafi Dawa now because the, the Saudi state is weakened, which means that the petrol dollars are not going to fund the Salafi Dawa? You don't have to agree with the Salafi Dawa, but you have to realize that what happens is that it, it goes beyond the Salafi Dawa. What, you, what begins to be the case is uh, the undermining of the black community. So are we going to take the black community once again in order to establish a certain position in uh, orientation and deen? Every time another position becomes popular, are we going to uh, traumatize the black community with it? And along with that goes the Latino community because the Latino community generally falls suit or falls in line with where the black community is at on many issues in this regard. 
And so we can't have that type of orientation. We need to jump to another level of scholarship where we can dialogue where there is actually truly common ground and where there's differences and why there's differences. And then we have to decide how we're going to engage each other. I'm not going to say that we is a kumbaya type of orientation that we should have, right? But there's no doubt that in this case, and what Mufti Munir was mentioning, it needs to be supported. In, these, in that regard, I'm not saying blind support for everything that said, this is not about personality boosting, but what he said is a position of leadership, is a position of scholarship. You understand what I'm saying? And that's that we should be fair and just, and we should be wise in how especially we're dealing with the nation of Islam. And I say the same thing, right? Because there is, in my estimation, I'll say this, and I, and, and I, and I mentioned this in certain circles before, the, as the nation of Islam continues to evolve and grow and develop, they have many, in many instances, tried to reach out to the Sunni community. They have come into the masajid. They have tried to celebrate Eid. They have tried to pray Salat al Juma with us. As a matter of fact, Mas Maryam prays Juma. You have many brothers that they are praying Salat. You understand what I'm saying? And that's not to say. I'm not going to take a missionary approach and say they have to come in our position. No, people have to come into Islam of their own volition and they have to intellectually migrate because we don't want people coming to Islam emotionally and, and feeling and they're intellectually, they're not grounded and they end up leaving Islam. You understand what I'm saying? But not everything that the nation has is un Islamic. There's many principles which are Islamic, many principles which are grounded in Islam. So that's another thing is that we're meeting a people that is just exactly what the same thing that, you know, was told to Moab. You know, they believe in certain things, you know what I'm saying, that are common ground. And so and there's things that we disagree with firmly, you understand? And, and that needs clarification because some people will, will, will look at that and they'll tear it apart and they say, what you mean and this, that, and so on and so forth. I mean that where there's truth, there's truth. You know, where, there, where there's issues, there's issues. You understand what I'm saying? But we can't throw out where there's truth and where there's goodness just because there's issues. That doesn't work like that. Dawah is about being patient with ourselves and being patient with other people. It is about learning how to increase what is good. Dawah at the end of the day is about seeing how we can uphold what works, not collapsing what works and what is good because we have issues with who it's coming from. You understand what I'm saying? And at the end of the day, is not our biggest battle. You understand? It's not our biggest battle. I personally see the imploding of the Muslim Sunni community as being the biggest struggle. Now, people have feelings. Things happen in the past, and I'm not comfortable with talking about those things online. Things happen in the past. Many of us who know know. You understand? What I'm saying the history is there. You know, if you wanna, if you wanna get a glimpse, just look at the history of Newark. You understand? What I'm saying, and, and you'll get an insight into that reality. But it's not only theirs in many places, but at the end of the day, people, I'm not saying just ignore things, but not all of us can be uh, stuck in the trauma of the past. You understand what I'm saying? And that doesn't mean that we are dismissing the trauma that people have suffered, but we definitely at the collective level can't afford to continue to perpetuate a religious orientation which is hostile to everyone. I mean, that's just not gonna work. You know, especially when it comes to internally what goes on within the black community is not healthy. It's not healthy to perpetuate that and to have that type of orientation. But I'm ending on this because I, I went way, you know, uh, further than where I wanted to go. We need a higher level of scholarship. Without a higher level of scholarship, we are not going to be able to engage ideas. And high level scholarship is not just refutation. That's not scholarship. High level of scholarship is to be able to identify what's right, what's good, why we differ, why we can't align on this, where there's differences that are allowable, that's a higher level of scholarship. You what I'm saying? When he looked at, you know, at certain realities of the philosophers and this group and that group, he acknowledged where, they, where there was goodness and where there was truth. You know? And that is the nature of Islamic scholarship. I've said that over and over again, but because people are not trained at in-depth, higher level, higher level scholarship. We're not talking about just quoting a hadith. We're not just talking about quoting an ayah of the Quran. We're talking about understanding principles of actual research and in-depth scholarship and being able to navigate ideas and being able to navigate concepts and reason 
in, in, in a principled manner. You understand what I'm saying? And, and that takes a higher level of scholarship. You know what I'm saying? That's why I have said that if the Salafis are really going to go to a higher level, you know, they're going to have to learn how to do community work and they're going to have to learn how to go to higher levels of scholarship. Read people like Imam Ibn Wazir, right? Imam Sanani, Mu'alim al Yemeni. Read people like Ibn Timiya and, and get out of the refutation mode and acknowledge that at the end of the day, the differences are going to exist. Imam al Ghazali, rahmatullahi he mentioned these differences existed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years back. So they're not going to be resolved because there's differences that are grounded in, in ideas of language and ideas of thinking and, and research. And, and, and it's just that's just the reality. But we, as a intellectual leadership, for lack of a better word, the Muslim community, we have to know how to how not to drag the community into conflicts that are going to make people go be and stay at war with each other so that they are productive. You understand what I'm saying? It, it, it's just not healthy. It's not healthy. Post COVID, the amount of mental health issues that have increased it don't allow us any room for any sort of religious orientation that is disruptive in an unnecessary manner. We have to learn how to create environments and conditions that allow people to heal and grow and stabilize themselves emotionally, mentally, and interpersonally. Because we need each other as inflation increases. We need more cooperation. We don't need uh, more of this unity. As, as, as things become more and more problematic for people in life, we need more cooperation and goodness to preserve human life. To preserve human life and keep the, the tables of justice aligned on the ground. I, I, I end with that. And if people have issue with what I've said, I say that yeah, let's dialogue it out. You understand what I'm saying? It's, there's no necessity to continue reputation, but we have to get to a point at which we are more productive in thought, emotion, spirituality, and most of all, in actions. Paper gold. You see, black folks are chumps. If America were to tell you to bring all the rocks in this country to her, and she'll give you a million dollars for it. You'll do it. And the next day she'll tell you, we're using rocks for currencies, chump.